I asked about sentient. What is a sentient being and the relationship of a sentient being to quote unquote being conscious? And you said off the top of your head, um, yeah, that a sentient being probably is a sentient beings can suffer and they lie upon a continuum. So oh, in my ahead. mind, after I read that this morning, when I was thinking, what is, what would count as suffering? I was having difficulty. I was thinking of anything, any living thing that wants to continue and it's being prevented from that or something thwarts that. So I was wondering if a tree is a sentient being or a fungus. A tree is a sentient being. Okay. For sure. But I'll a, talk to one. And spe- get to know one tree really, really well. You know, maybe when you walk by or something like that. It's preferably an older tree or, you know, it could be an adolescent tree. Just get to know it really, really well. And and you'll see. But a rock. But, but see, I'm, 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 but now I've, in a way I've contradicted myself because I said sentient beings were beings that could suffer. And I frankly, I don't know if the tree can suffer per se. I suspect, you know, they do a little bit in a weird kind of way, non-neurological kind of way. But see, all of this is just projection. The world, of course, is a projection. And, and so, you know, we could, we could play around with these at the edges, but in the, in the end, we can't know. We don't know what life is, and we're not going to know what life is until we know what consciousness is. And then when we know what consciousness is, we know that it, it fades off into to the... It, it's, we can't know the outer limits of it. And we can't know... At least I haven't learned... Uh, Many, many, I mean, it's, it's endlessly fascinating. And so if you try and draw the line between sentient and non-sentient, it's like drawing the line between life and non-life. I mean, I remember when I was in school, they taught me, well, life is something that moves and eats and reproduces. And I go, oh, well, that sounds reasonable. And then it turns out that none of those hold up. And so, uh, the construct, the concept of sentient and non-sentient is a human concept. I mean, that's just a concept, right? And I'm not sure we can draw a, a uh, scientific distinctions. But if we were to do such a thing, we'd find that uh, consciousness, from a scientific point of view, likely lies upon a continuum the same way uh, the other construct of, of intelligence lies on a continuum or even great, uh, uh, darkness is on a continuum. This, so, so these are, we're, we're trying to approach the sublime using crude words like rock and, and river and sky and cloud. And, you know, just we're, we're too crude to, to fully grok these things. Now, Another question, an important question that arises, and it's an important distinction. Can psychists believe that an organism, like a, uh, you know, is an individual entity and that it, uh, it has its own, you know, dollop of consciousness, depending on how many neurons it has. That's the uh, integrated information theory. The more complex the nervous system, the more consciousness. Well, it's true that the nervous system correlates with consciousness, but since we don't know what consciousness is, I think it would be foolish to start enumerating how we're going to measure it in that manner. And I think that's the consensus now. I mean, in the, in the you know, in the last couple of years, they've given up on that. I, I think I don't follow it. So they would say that uh, just like a, a human and a dog has consciousness that a, a tree and a rock has consciousness and not only a rock, but uh, a glass of water, I guess, or whatever. And that's very different than the, the, uh, than accurate in my opinion. And, and we can go into that at some other time. I'm going to have to stop in just a bit. I've got a 10 o'clock too. And so, uh, so the difference between sentient and, and unsentient would be the difference, like the difference between living and non-living. Mm. 
we have to examine the assumption that's built into our construct. And that's just something that scientists are just now learning how to do. And, and when they do that, finally, they'll, they'll, no, I shouldn't say that. They, they've already, it depends on the field. But, but so, uh, we can't tell living from non-living unless you have some new definition or can you give me a better, can you, how can we distinguish living from non-living? I don't know. Yeah. And, uh, and okay. you can do it anywhere you want, any way you want. And you, the results are as valid as the people that you know. I mean, it's, it's all parochial, I guess the human view is a parochial view. And, and both these questions, although they're really good questions, they're human questions. And just because a human can ask a question in a human way doesn't mean they're going to get an answer from reality. Yeah. Right? Because it's a wrong question. And there's some book, uh, or who was it that said, somebody famous and influential or something said once, you know, if only we could, yeah, it was a scientist one it sounds like a good scientist too he said if only we can could know what question to ask right because it's really our questions that are off mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? scientifically speaking but the, but the but the the end is already written and the end is just fine there's nothing to be worried about or anything like that or humans get all excited about stuff like that but the, the the reality is not of this world, right? This world exists within reality. It doesn't, yeah, and and not in the way people suspect. But that, and what's very strange is why is this so hard for people to get? It's to in retrospect, it's obvious that many people have said though, Plato, I mean Socrates, mm -hmm. uh, Muhammad, you know, so, uh, you know, it's, it's as if, you know, that, that say the worker is hidden in the workshop. Mm -hmm. now, now that I'm an old man, the word hidden seems like it should be emphasized as if we're being actively shielded or kept from or, or denied access to the truth, the vast, vast bulk of humanity. I don't understand that. Do you? Do you have any ideas? Are you saying you don't understand I mean, we why know, we, we can... Know how, we know how to end suffering, right? We know how to approach any subject in a, in a manner better than any parochial or partial or limited or, or agenda driven way. We know how to do all these things. Mm -hmm. Very, very few people are interested. Why is that? I guess fear. I guess. I, okay. I guess. I don't know. I mean, but that's the one that convinces me. Why would be why would be afraid of truth? Because you don't know it. Like, why would you be afraid of being in the middle of a forest or jungle at three a.m. in the morning yeah. when it's dark? Also, oh, you're saying only a few people will go into the jungle or climb the mountain or go to the bottom of the ocean and explore. I mean, the explorers among us are few. Well, yeah. If you take Orenstein's or any any understanding of evolutionary adaptation now. And how people can quickly come to either dichotomies about things or a quick heuristic or image of something. And then that to be afraid of that thing, just as like a quick shortcut so for survival, yeah. given that we live in an animal body, then I totally understand why you'd be, why fear would dominate almost 98 plus percent of thinking. Unless Good. Excellent. So keep thinking about these things, right? It's a, it's a process, and it's not an individual process. This enlightening thing, okay? Nothing. To, I mean, the individual is of very little consequence in in matters of reality. And so, uh, yeah, good. You keep thinking about it and and carry it forward, right? 